The scary stories will start in 30 seconds. Before they do, I just want to remind you to subscribe to my channel. As always, I stand firm on my minimal ad promise. And as a show of good faith, there will only be two mid-roll ads in this video. I really want you to enjoy my videos without being interrupted constantly. I know it's very distracting and irritating. So again, if you enjoy my videos, please subscribe and hit the thumbs up. It helps me more than you know. Now, let's begin. When I was little, like six or seven, I had dreams that I would wake up late at night and see my mom smiling and standing in the darkness in my bedroom, watching me sleep. I would call out to her, but she couldn't hear me. She would just smile and look at me. This was a recurring dream for years, and it was beyond terrifying. When I was about 11, my parents separated, and I went to live with my dad. Although I had told my friends about these dreams, for some reason, I never talked about it with my dad, until this one random night that we were eating dinner. I asked my dad what he thought the dreams meant. He stopped eating and sat there for a minute, and then finally said, You weren't dreaming, buddy. Your mom has had mental problems her entire life. She loves you very much, but you weren't dreaming. She would go into your room and watch you sleep sometimes. This sent a shiver down my spine, and after a minute or two, we resumed eating. That night, while laying in bed, I realized something. Why did my mom not respond when I called out to her? She would just stand there and smile at me. The time this story happened was only a year ago, me being 15 and living with, at the time, just my mom and my 10-year-old brother. My dad was staying somewhere else for the time being. At this time in the story, we were moving from house to house, financially not very stable, but getting by. We had found a house conveniently right next to one of the largest cemeteries in town, and I didn't mind it, but both my brother and my mom found it creepy. The house had three stories if you included the basement. Something about that basement scared me. It always felt like something or someone was down there. And that whole year we lived there, I never stepped foot down there. Not once. To give some context, my room was upstairs. There were three rooms up there, and I'll tell you how it looked for the sake of the story. There was the staircase that went up to a landing and then a smaller staircase leading to the second floor. My room was the first thing that you saw. My brother's room was to the right of it, and the extra room was to the left. My mom kept the extra room locked, saying that it was unsafe to be in there. Everything about this house felt wrong. According to both of my parents, the house was extremely old, being built in the 1800s. It was freaky. All the doors had those creepy old keyholes, and the way that the house was structured seemed unnatural and weird. The turns and placement of rooms was odd, only making the house seem creepier. I never minded it until this happened. I had been texting my friend Chloe before deciding to set my phone down and finally get some sleep. I don't remember what time it was, but it was late. I fell asleep rather quickly being worn out from school and stress. However, I'm a light sleeper. Any noise could wake me up. I was turned on my side facing the wall when I heard the loud creaks of the stairs. The steps stopped at the landing, creaking ever so slightly, as if someone was rocking on their feet. I ignored it, but it did make my heart race as I heard the steps begin again, stopping at the top of the stairs. It was probably my brother, no big deal. Closing my eyes, I heard my door creak open, and footsteps come into my room, stopping at the edge of my bed. Someone was standing over me, just watching. 
A bit freaked out, I did a side glance and out of the corner of my eye, I saw my brother standing over me, and letting out an annoying grunt, I asked, What do you want? There was no response. Sighing and closing my eyes, I rolled onto my side. I opened my eyes to look at him again, and my heart stopped. He wasn't there. Standing up, I trudged to his room, but he wasn't there. No one was there. After that, I felt uneasy as I turned to go back to my room, but I froze. That door that was always locked was open. Did he go in there? I remember going in and grabbing my phone, turning on the flashlight and just standing there, staring at my floor. Something felt so wrong. My gut told me that I wasn't alone. There was someone in there with me, and they were not good. Slowly I went to shine my light into the room to see if my brother was there. There was nothing. At this point I heard my heart pounding in my ears as I shut the door quietly going back to my room. I told myself it was my imagination as I laid back in bed and closed my eyes. I fell asleep eventually, silently muttering prayers under my breath to put my mind at ease. I did question my brother the next morning if he had gone upstairs, but he just told me no. Ever since that night, every night I hear footsteps coming from upstairs, and they stop at my door. I began to have nightmares of a very tall man coming up from the basement and to my door, peering his pale face inside to look at me with his unnaturally wide and terrifying smile. Not only that, but the door that my mom kept locked since then would be found wide open almost every morning I woke up. Something was wrong with that house, and I'm just glad we don't live there anymore. I remember back when I was seven, my family and I moved into a new house. We had only been there for a few months, and our next door neighbors were constantly fighting. Our houses were fairly close, almost a full arm's length away from one of our windows. One night, as my sisters and I were getting ready for bed, we heard the usual arguing and thought nothing of it. The next day after I finished getting dressed for school, I walked outside my front door and as I was walking up to the front gate, I noticed something to my left in my neighbor's front yard. It was the young woman, just laying on the ground on her back. I vividly remember the way she looked. She was wearing a pink shirt, and her right arm was stretched out towards the fence. My mom came out next and saw her right away. She quickly rushed me and my sisters into the car and dropped us off at school. When I got home that day, there was police tape blocking off the neighbor's house, and that's when I realized that she had been dead. I honestly thought that she had passed out from drinking or something, but she was murdered by her lover, stabbed in the stomach multiple times. I'm originally from Arizona, but I grew up in Nebraska, in a small town about an hour south of the South Dakota border. My life leading up to my living in Nebraska was riddled with abuse and a lot of childhood trauma. My biological father was abusive, and my mother was absent for part of my childhood. I am also bipolar and take daily medication to make my quality of life better because of what happened to me as a child. I currently reside in Oklahoma. To start, I never really experienced anything paranormal growing up. That is until my mom's boyfriend, whom she is still with to this day, came into our lives. He was a good man and ran a small hardware store at which my mom also worked. Before meeting him, she was married to an awful man that did terrible things to me, many of which I still go to therapy for to this day. After the divorce, we spent a lot more time at her boyfriend's house. The house was built in the early 1900s 
and it was absolutely huge and beautiful. She never told us at first that it used to be an old mortuary. Her boyfriend's father, who moonlighted as a mortician, ran the hardware store in town, which was passed down to his son upon his death. Even after telling my brother and I, my brother being 12 and I 15 at the time, that the house was an old mortuary, it never really bothered us. We spent our summers there swimming and playing PlayStation 3 and genuinely having a good time. Quite honestly, the best summers of my teen years. I enjoyed it. The home was warm and inviting. That is, until you got to the basement. The steps leading down to the basement were steep, about ten of them before you reached the bottom. The basement had flooded many times before, so there was no carpet, just cold cement. Immediately to the right was a refrigerator, the washer and dryer, and the cubicle shower, which was flush against the wall and was positioned so it was directly behind you when you came down the stairs. If you walked forward, there were two couches positioned in an L shape to the right. The longest one pushed against the west wall. To the left were two brick pillars that acted as support beams for the house, spaced five feet apart with a dirty old blanket hanging between them as a shield. Behind the blanket was a vertical rectangle of a room. One half was a wooden workbench of old tools and trinkets, a random toilet that actually worked, and in the far left corner of the rectangle was a small pile of remnants from when the house was an acting mortuary. There was a bathtub, no longer operational, piles of wood shelving, and a small metal table on wheels. I always felt anxious going into the basement. I never could figure out why, but the atmosphere down there made me feel uneasy. I would sometimes come down to the basement to get a soda from the refrigerator, and I always had the feeling of static across my back, my neck, and my shoulders. It would make my hair stand on end, and I never walked up the stairs like normal people do. I walked backwards, because there was always the feeling of someone right behind you, making your fight or flight response kick in. It was definitely not my favorite place to be. My first encounter happened when I saw a shadow dart across the wall as I came down to get a soda. I knew the shadow wasn't my own, and I even tried to duplicate it, but I couldn't. The shadow passed along the ground level window almost eight feet up. There's no way it was mine. I left quickly and slammed the door shut behind me, but the main incident that cemented my belief in the paranormal happened when I was 15. I had just gotten back from swimming all day, and I was sunburned and looking forward to rinsing off. But of course, the only shower in the house was, you guessed it, in the basement. I grabbed some clothes and headed down to get it over with. I didn't want to be down there longer than I had to. I grabbed a towel from the wire rack above the washer and dryer, turned on the water, got undressed, and hopped in. The glass in the little shower was tempered, meaning you could see blobs of shapes and colors, but no real definition. I was rinsing off and proceeded to close my eyes and put my head under the stream of water. I moved out of the way, wiped my eyes, and opened them. I froze. Through the glass, I could see someone standing there to the left. My mom was upstairs taking a nap, and my brother was on the second floor playing PlayStation. There would be no reason for either of them to be down there, especially standing still looking at me. I stared at the shape through the glass. That feeling of unease came over me again, but stronger this time. I stood there for a moment, gathering up the courage to open the door. Slowly, I pushed it open, never taking my eyes off of the figure. But when I opened the door, there was nothing. No one was there. I looked around, surveying the area, and when I was satisfied that I was alone, I closed the door, and the figure was gone. I hurriedly finished my shower, threw on a towel, and started to back up, up the stairs. Every step I took, I could feel the sense of unease growing, like an unseen mass filling the room. 
This happened many more times over the next few years, but I continued to see the shadow. I did my best to ignore it, but the feeling of unease never wavered. I never showered with either the basement door or the shower door closed again. Water on the floor be damned. Last year around this time, I was at a Christmas party at my friend John's house. I didn't really know anyone there and didn't do much talking. Everyone at the party seemed very nice. About an hour after I arrived, we started playing a game called the White Elephant. It's where you trade gifts among everyone, and everyone has an opportunity to steal a gift from someone else if they like it more than what they have. I had never played it before, but I'm pretty sure that's how it worked. In the middle of the game, a woman opened an envelope and read a note that was inside. Her face turned red, and she became noticeably very uncomfortable and started looking around and was repeating, This isn't funny. Everyone wanted to know what the note said, and she started to read it out loud, and then stopped. She couldn't do it. She handed the note to a man next to her. His face turned red as well and he seemed uncomfortable too. Now everyone was demanding to know what it said. He gulped and started to read the words aloud. I have killed six people. This is not a joke. The room became quiet and deadly serious when moments before everyone was laughing. There were gasps and a couple people said things like, very funny. It was very clear that the joyous mood was now shattered. Some people started yelling and demanding to know who wrote it. I eventually asked to see it, and when it was handed to me, I saw that it was typed. People began to argue very intensely, and I quickly grabbed my coat from the couch in the other room and told John that I was going to take off. He nodded and was trying to calm people down. I walked out the door into the fresh falling snow. I haven't spoken with John too much since then, but I did ask him once if he found out who wrote the note, and he said no, that the party broke up shortly after I left. I often wonder if it really was not a joke, and somebody had confessed in a very twisted way to being a serial killer. During this last winter, my friends and I were doing urbex, and we decided to check out the infamous asylum on the edge of town. For the story's sake, I'll call my friends Steve, Joe, and Richard. We decided to go at night to avoid unwanted attention from the security that patrols the grounds. Driving up to the place, you can truly see what 30 years of abandonment can do to a building. Vines growing up the sides, busted out windows, animals claiming the building as theirs, and of course, the graffiti. Steve parked his car behind some brush to remain hidden from the street. We started to walk to the patient housing and treatment building. Only brightened by the moonlight, we could see the beautiful early 1900s architecture of the four-story building. As our group climbed over the fence, we approached the entrance and put on our respirators. As we opened the old paint-chipped door, we instantly saw a looming staircase that went to the first floor. Once we climbed the stairs, we noticed that it led to the dormitories, but the staircase kept going up three more floors. I came up with the idea to split into two groups so that we could cover more ground and try to find something cool. So Joe and I, the two youngest of the group, decided that we would venture to the second floor while Steve and Richard would explore the first. We told each other good luck and headed up to the second floor. Using our phone's flashlights, Joe and I were able to make out the words patient treatment and offices on the old metal door. To our surprise, it was unlocked and we found ourselves facing a seemingly never-ending system of hallways. Most of the rooms contained those old hydrotherapy bathtubs we stumbled onto the urbex gold mine. We were so anxious to explore the rest. I noticed that Joe stopped walking 
as if he was listening to something. I said, Joe, what are you? Until I was cut off by Joe shushing me. He then pointed to his ear and pointed below us. I stopped to listen and could make out a faint voice of two men humming. I told Joe, it's probably just Steve and Richard. It was at that moment that we both turned our heads to the door that we entered through, and right when we did, the metal door slammed shut with force. Steve? Joe said nervously. The only response that we got was more of the humming, no more than ten yards away. This was our cue to leave. We sprinted down two long winding hallways, and all the while could hear pounding footsteps right behind us. When we got to the end of the hallway, I could make out an old fire exit sign with the glow of my light. Joe and I barely made it to the door and slammed it shut. Through the small busted pane of glass of the door, I could make out three dark figures, at least, ten feet from the door. We found the stairs and pretty much jumped down them and then bursted out the exit. I don't think Joe or I have ever climbed a fence that fast in our lives. We didn't stop running until we got to the car. To our surprise, Steve and Richard were both sitting in the front seats. We screamed to unlock the doors and frantically told Steve to drive away. Steve looked confused driving away, leaving that nightmare of a place behind us. Richard wanted to stop and get coffee, and during this time, they told us what they experienced. As Joe and I went upstairs, Steve and Richard entered the dormitory space. They checked out a couple of rooms, but said that they were all empty, so Steve wanted to call me to check if we found anything cool. But it went directly to voicemail, so Steve and Richard figured that we just left the building. When Joe and I asked if they had heard humming, they just looked at us as if we were crazy. That was the first time I went to that asylum, and it will certainly be the last. This all happened about five years ago or so, and in a pretty short time frame. We had been living in our old house for almost three or four years at the time, and we were good friends with the family that lived across the street. The family, or at least the parents, had a bucket list item to move to a European country for a couple years or so. They finally had the means to fulfill their dreams and went for it. However, they didn't sell their house. Instead, they rented it out to a couple different families during their absence and moved back in after they came back. The first family that moved in were nice, if a bit reserved and mysterious. I think they had moved before the end of the school year, so I never got to know them well. The second family, on the other hand, was a different story. The family that moved in had three kids, an infant who isn't important to the story, a girl who I'll call Doris, and a boy, who I will call Alex. Being good neighbors, our family introduced ourselves to them and had the normal conversations people have when people move into the neighborhood. The parents seemed nice and all, but as a 12-year-old, I was more interested to talk to their kids. Both my sister and I were a few grades above both Alex and Doris. Doris was the older of the two and was a lot calmer than Alex. She was holding a small conversation with us while Alex was talking non-stop. I basically only fit in one-word responses to his questions because he talked so much. Eventually the parent conversation ended and we went back home. I remember thinking afterward that the kid was nice, but there was a big age difference between us, maybe five years or so, which seems like a lot for kids, and that I wasn't really interested in hanging out with him. Well, of course, my parents wanted to be friendly with the neighbors, so anytime Alex and Doris came to our house and asked to play, we were forced to. It wasn't the worst, especially since they had moved in during the summer, and us being so young, we didn't really have anything better to do. We would do the usual kid stuff, like messing around on bikes or making up some sort of game, but it was more for their enjoyment than ours, because my sister and I were starting to grow out of that stuff. I was in middle school at this point, so when school started up again, 
I couldn't spend time with Alex as much anymore. I can attest to that being the mindset of children. As the school year continued, it got to the point where I really didn't have time to spend with him, and if I did, I wanted to spend it doing anything else, so I would just lie and say that I was busy. He would proceed with a follow-up question something along the lines of, Why not? My response would always be like, Because I have homework, or something like that. One actual excuse that I used was, I can't because my parents aren't home which was a rule they had instated. It bothered me that someone would be so nosy like that, and it wasn't just him. Doris would also ask my sister the same follow-up questions as well. We had found out recently that they were from a different country, so we chalked it up to it being a cultural thing. So up until now, it doesn't seem like much, right? But this is where it gets strange. One day, about halfway through the school year, my parents had left me home alone, and were gone with my sister somewhere. My parents had trusted me staying home alone for a number of years at that point, so it wasn't too uncommon. As a side note, they tried the babysitting thing one time, but I had no idea why, since by that time I had already proven myself to be responsible at home by myself. I mostly spent my time in my bedroom. I was watching YouTube or browsing some site when I realized that I was getting hungry so I decided to go grab a snack. Now, my bedroom was at the front of our house, and it sat to the left of the front door from the inside. The kitchen was literally ten feet from my bedroom to the other side of the front door, so I walked out, looking down, as I continued to watch YouTube on our family iPad. When I looked up towards the kitchen, I jumped and felt my heart stop when I looked through the kitchen doorway Alex was standing in my house, in the middle of the kitchen. I caught my breath and was able to ask him what he was doing. He simply responded with, I just wanted to ask if I can play with you. I was completely taken back. All I could conjure up as a response was to tell him that my parents weren't home, and that meant that I couldn't play right now. I don't remember his response, but I do remember him walking out of the house, and then I immediately locked the door afterward. There's a few things that really scared me about this event when I think about it in hindsight. The front door in that house, which I guess I forgot to lock, is really loud. I hear it every time someone comes and leaves, so if that's how he came in, I don't know how I didn't hear him. The other thing that scares me in hindsight is that he knew where my bedroom was, so I don't know why he went to the kitchen instead of my room, and if he did come to my room, I guess I just didn't notice him. Or maybe, he just creepily stared at me before going to the kitchen. Unfortunately, this wasn't the last time he entered our house uninvited. He came in twice more. The second I don't remember well, but I think he entered our back door and just made himself at home in our living room. And on the other time, he tried getting into our house through the backyard, because he heard me and some friends hanging out. My mom actually caught him on the third time, and talked to his mom after that. There were two other significant incidents that I can remember. First was the last time he tried entering our house uninvited. The difference this time is that he didn't make it in. My sister and I were in the living room home alone when we heard the doorbell ring. I was able to peek out without them seeing and confirm that it was Alex, but this time he was accompanied by Doris. We both didn't have to go through the merry-go-round of explaining why we couldn't play, so we just ignored it and went back to what we were doing. They rang maybe twice more before they seemingly left. I went into the kitchen to grab a snack or something and looked out the kitchen window. I was surprised to see Alex and Doris not walking home, but walking along the side of our house. We had most of our blinds down, but I saw them trying to look in. I was extremely creeped out and suddenly just got this sick feeling, telling me that we needed to hide. I grabbed my sister and we ducked into our laundry room which didn't have any windows, but did have a door to the backyard. A few minutes later we heard the door handle being rattled and pushed for a few seconds before they seemingly moved on. We stayed in there until we were sure they were gone. It was very creepy that they tried to break into our house, 
but that still was not the worst event. The final time I spent with Alex, we were in a tree in his front yard. I was not, and am still not, a skilled climber, so I just stood on the lowest branch, which was maybe five or six feet off the ground. I had one hand holding a thinner branch that was above me. The branch was not perfectly above the one I was standing on, so I was leaning forward slightly. We were talking about something, and again, he was doing most of the talking. He made his way around the tree above me, and stopped on the branch I was holding. I wasn't really paying attention when he asked me, Hey, guess what? I just looked out to the street below us. What? I replied. Surprise, he said. I felt him shove my hand off the branch I was holding, and I began to fall forward. I quickly reached my other hand up and grabbed the branch just as I began to lose my footing. I remember looking up and asking him why he did that, and he just said something like he was having fun. I cut our time short and climbed down from the tree. As I started walking away from his house, his mom came outside and asked if we needed anything. She then noticed my face and asked if I was alright. I told her what Alex did, but I did not get the response that I expected. Her face went blank, and she just went over to him and solemnly and wordlessly brought him inside. His mom's look read something like, It happened again, and there's nothing I can do. From what I can tell, he was never punished. Thankfully, they moved away, but only a few blocks, and at the end of the school year. But then we ended up moving a few years later as well, so I never had to see Alex again. I truly believe he is going to do something awful someday to someone. Every moment I ever spent with him, I never really felt safe. His lack of understanding or remorse made no sense, even for a boy his age. I especially fear meeting him again someday, as an adult. The story that I'm about to tell you happened when I was 11 years old, and was one of my first times riding the bus without my parents or my sister. So the day this happened, I was coming home from my school. Now I won't say the exact location for privacy reasons, but to get home from my school, I had to take one bus to get over to my street, and then take one more bus to get home. My parents were at work, and my sister had class after school so I would be alone at home for about an hour. I walked down to the bus stop and got on. Now, since it was a weekday, the bus was pretty crowded, but I was able to find a seat near the back. I was going to be the last stop, so was glad to have the place to sit. After a few stops, the bus emptied out a bit, and a few of the seats around me, including the one next to me, were free. Then, at the next stop, a man who appeared to be about 40 years old got on. I didn't think anything of it and assumed that he would sit in the seats nearer to the front since they were easiest to access. But to my surprise, he looked over to me, walked back, and took the seat right next to me. Now, I was pretty socially awkward, so I wasn't exactly overjoyed, but I didn't want to be rude, so I just sat quietly. At the next stop, the last one before mine, everyone except for him and I got off. Now he hadn't talked to me yet, but I had a feeling that he had been staring at me for a while. As soon as the bus started up again, he tapped my shoulder to get my attention. Stupidly I turned to look at him, and what he said gave me goosebumps. You know, you shouldn't be out here by yourself. Some people are very bad. Then he stroked my hair and said, You'd probably sell for quite a bit. I was horrified. By this time we were pulling up to the last stop, so I picked up my things and ran out of the bus. I had always thought my neighborhood was safe and had never really been taught about these sort of things, but at the time, I didn't really care. I ran to catch the connecting bus and got on just before it left. I took a seat by the window facing the sidewalk and leaned against it, 
trying to catch my breath. While the bus was driving away, I looked back and saw the man from the bus just standing on the curb watching me with the biggest and creepiest grin on his face. My mom is really good friends with one of the wealthiest people in our town. They have a daughter, my age. I don't have a crush on her or anything, but my mom had pushed me to ask her out before, but I never did. Here's the weird thing about this situation. My mom and this friend, along with her daughter, all kind of act like their friend. Like a bunch of high school girls getting together to gossip. My mom works in a beauty salon, so I guess I understand why she likes to act that way, but it's still pretty weird nonetheless. There was one specific occasion when this woman and her daughter were going to visit New York City. They decided to invite my mom for some reason. I don't understand why. I guess they really were better friends than I had previously believed. But my mom decided to say yes, so it was just me and my dad at the house. But here was the thing. They didn't have a dad at home. Their house was going to be completely unsupervised for the entire weekend. I was in my early 20s at the time, so I guess they thought it would be a good idea to ask if I would watch the house for them, which I agreed to do. I didn't get paid or anything, but they said I was allowed to eat as much food as I wanted, and considering they were rich as hell, I thought, why not? This also gave me an opportunity to write some short stories. I think it was that Friday night when I was watching their house. They told me they had two cats, but they were really scared of strangers and I was probably not going to see either one of them the entire night. This didn't bother me. I just had to make sure that they had food and water, which I did. I was chilling at the kitchen table pounding the keys on my laptop on my latest story, when all of a sudden, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I looked up from my computer to notice the ugliest cat that I had ever seen in my life. Just imagine a hairless cat, but also morbidly obese and cross-eyed. It was the strangest thing I've ever seen. Any one of those traits, individually, would have made a cat kind of cute, but seeing them all thrown on one pitiful excuse for a pet made me want to bust a gut laughing. I felt kind of bad for laughing so hard at this girl's cat but it's not like I heard it or anything. That had been a good break from writing, but then I got back into it. I remember being in the middle of writing a really interesting scene. This ghost was abducting the protagonist of the story. It's kind of a psychological thriller with a little bit of paranormal thrown in there. It's very spiritual and weird. I'm kind of a weird person. But that scene still sticks with me because as I was writing it, I noticed something outside. There was a man in a hooded sweatshirt walking around. I sat at the kitchen table stunned. I didn't know what to do. I felt adrenaline burst through my veins. Fight or flight. Well, I figured that my car was outside, so running wasn't going to do me much good. And after a minute of rationalizing the situation, I had no proof that this person was out to do anything bad. For all I knew, this could have been a jogger. I got up close to one of the windows to watch this man. He seemed to be sneaking around. He wasn't coming toward the house I was in, so I figured that I was at least safe for the moment. But then, I noticed him looking into the window of the house across the street. I can only assume that he was checking houses to see if people were home or not. A few minutes went by, and I could even tell that there were people home at the house he was checking out. By the time he realized, I noticed him do a 180. He was walking in my direction now. I was about to be face to face with this man. I saw him walking across the street and I immediately started to panic. I called the police as fast as I could and told them the situation, but they said it would be at least 20 minutes before anyone could be there. I ran up to the attic to hide. I locked the door behind me. In retrospect, this was my biggest mistake. 
I should have turned on a bunch of lights and made it obvious that somebody was home. I'm good at thinking, just not in the moment. The house must have looked uninhabited by the time I got up to the attic. I was in the attic for about ten minutes when I heard a window breaking downstairs. He was inside the house. My heartbeat was in my forehead. He walked around the house for a few minutes. Thud. Thud. I heard the humongous boots marching across the wooden floors. He explored the house for a good while. I was really beginning to wonder where the police were. Typical of them. I heard him get close to the attic entrance, and that was the moment that pushed me over the edge. I started screaming at the top of my lungs that I had a gun. I told him that I would blow his head off if he didn't leave the house immediately. To my absolute shock, he ran away. I watched him run down the street as I looked on through the window. It appeared that this guy was even more scared for his life than I was. The police eventually got there, and I told them the entire story from beginning to end. They said that a couple of people had been reporting this guy in nearby neighborhoods, so this wasn't the first night that he has been doing this. The police explained that this guy hadn't been violent on any of the occasions they had been called to. They said that it was about the seventh time this month that they've responded to a similar incident in a wealthy neighborhood. I guess he's going around looking for any easy way to make money? He hasn't been face to face with any homeowners yet, so maybe he isn't a violent criminal. Just a criminal? I found the entire experience really interesting, yet terrifying. Living through it was probably the most scared I've ever been. My mom, her friend, and their daughter didn't even come back early from their trip after it happened. I thought that was a lame move, but what do I know? For revenge, I ate every single pizza roll they had in the freezer. And if you're wondering, there were three bags of the 90 pizza rolls. I ate 270 pizza rolls that weekend, and I have no regrets. I sorely needed them after that borderline traumatic experience with that burglar. This happened around 2012, but I remember most of what happened clear as day. It's a long story, but you'll soon know about the incident with the people that I never want to run into ever again. I worked with my girlfriend at a busy restaurant. We worked all the time, and it was very stressful. We took off a few days and decided to fly somewhere to get away from work and people and the town in general. I found decent deals and flights to Ocean City, Maryland for two nights. She had never been on a plane. We loved the beach, and I could hit up all the local crab cake spots. It was perfect. We flew into Baltimore and rented a car. Nothing memorable happened the first day. We laid on the beach, we hit up all the local shops and had forgettable food. The second full day, we woke up and went to the most recommended stop for crab cakes, and on the way back we stopped and got a crab cake to go from two other recommended places for later. We stopped by the hotel to drop off the food and went to the hotel bar for a few drinks. My girlfriend at the time was a smoker and I hated it. She also would attract attention from guys which I would deal with but wasn't thrilled about. We go to the rooftop bar at the hotel and the bar itself is a four-sided island in the middle of the patio. It's probably 2 p.m. in a clear sunny day. We pull up chairs and there's only a few women on the left side of the bar and a guy bartending behind it. We got obligatory house margaritas. After her first drink, my girlfriend felt like she wanted to smoke, but the girls and the bartender didn't have one to bum her. We got refills and schmoozed the bartender about the areas and things to do, but mainly kept to ourselves. The bartender seemed as if he was being fake. Something was off and I couldn't put my finger on it. A feeling of, I really don't even want to run to the restroom and leave her alone at the bar because I don't trust something. More than a few times he asked us if we were staying at the hotel. I think I said no. The girlfriend said yes. He asked us what room at one point. My girlfriend went to use the restroom 
A minute later, I heard guys' voices. I didn't realize there was a group of three to four guys that sat at a table directly behind us. They were either playing cards or just smoking, but they made some comment to her when she walked back. We finished our drinks and were googling tropical drinks for her and an area hotspots to check out. The guys came up on either side of us and talked to the bartender and got beers. You could tell they were either friends or regulars. I honestly couldn't tell you if they were there when we came to the bar or came after, but they had a sleazy vibe. The girlfriend and I ended up walking to the only other couple at the bar that had come and sat down. It was nice to be away and just relax. We always like making new friends. I didn't realize it, but one of the guys came up and either brushed against my girl or made a comment and rubbed her the wrong way. So in her infinite wisdom, she wanted to be bothersome to them and got up and asked to bum a smoke. I didn't realize it until I turned around and there she was, talking to the guy with his shirt unbuttoned and gold chains hanging on his chest. I didn't want her associating with them, but if one gave her a smoke, I would get the guy a beer if it meant we didn't have to leave the bar to hit a store for smokes. She came back without a cigarette, mad. Apparently the guys kept asking, what's in it for us? and said, your boyfriend wants to fight us, then why would we give you anything? I didn't want to fight them. I was on vacation and I wasn't paying any attention to them, but I didn't like the implication of the other comment at all. Because we had such a lackluster first day, I wanted to pack in fun things this day. So this drink was my last one. I asked for the tab, and the guy of the couple we met gave us his business card. He said we should meet him and his girlfriend at Secrets at 8 p.m., the guys behind us kind of swarmed in on all sides and slammed down a pack of cigarettes, with two smokes left inside, in between me and my girlfriend. They said something like, here, then they ordered another round. We found it odd, but I thanked them and offered them a shot. I don't even think they replied. One asked if we were vacationing, then asked if we were staying at the hotel, then took the round of beers back to the table. I had a weird feeling as if they were locals and didn't like us because we were visitors. Turning back to the bar, my drink was now completely full. Stupid me didn't even question it. I didn't want to refill, but figured the bartender topped me off. I took a sip and the drink was strong. I just closed out, so maybe it was a thank you for the tip drink. It was disgustingly strong. I told my girl to try it. Boozy Susie over here takes a huge pull from my drink and nearly spit it back out. It was gross. She made a face and said that it shouldn't taste like that. I couldn't even ask the bartender about it, because he was gone. I don't know when he disappeared, but he was nowhere to be found. I can't remember if I fully finished that nasty drink. My girlfriend said something along the lines of, The guys are staring. Let's go. I was originally worried she was going to chat them up and thank them before we left, but she said she felt weird. The whole vibe changed, and she wanted to go. I remember spending a minute or two saying goodbye to the couple that we were going to meet later and heading towards the doors of the hotel. The guys weren't at their table. Patio door, elevator, hotel room door, bed. My eyes opened and I turned my head right. The alarm clock reached 3 a.m. I'm face down in bed on top of the covers. I push myself up, slide back off the bed and stand up. The sliding glass doors are wide open, as are the screen doors to the balcony. There's a breeze. I think, did my girlfriend jump off the balcony? And in that millisecond, I hear crying behind me. My girlfriend is sitting Indian style on the floor, with a clamshell of what was $40 worth of crab cakes in her lap, crying. She said she couldn't wake me up. She asked me if I had remembered what happened. She said she had been sick and been throwing up for four hours nonstop. What happened? I bent over to sit down with her and got hit with a wave of sickness and I ran to the bathroom for hours puking. By the time I came out, she was passed out again. This had to be a bad dream. I remember thinking that maybe we went to the club and got wasted and blacked out and I went back to bed. We both wake up at 7am to our alarms. We had to take the rental to Baltimore and catch a flight back. We both had to be work at 2 today. I was shaking. She looked like hell. We both felt like death. She was shook. She said the walk back to the hotel room was scary and she didn't remember anything after. Wait, what? According to her, when we walked into the hotel from the bar patio, one of the guys was on a chair near the elevators. He said something to us but the doors closed quickly. 
She said when we got to our floor, two of the guys were at the end of the hall, heading towards us. She said that when we got to the room, they stood outside the door, and she thinks they knocked. Apparently, I laid on the bed, and immediately was lights out. She couldn't wake me, and passed out herself, until she woke up to violent vomit for hours. My body was shot, I was shaking, and now I'm processing that these scumbags maybe followed us to our room. Part of me thought she was exaggerating, but you know how you have a weird slow motion flashback? Well, as I was graying out on the way to the hotel room, I remember one of the guys being by the elevator. Also, as she was brushing her teeth, her mouth was blue. I went to the mirror and so was mine, neon blue. Nothing we had that day was blue. I had light green margaritas and vodka and root beer. This was proof that something fishy had to have happened. We didn't know what to do. We had to get back. We couldn't stick around. We got to the car. I barely felt okay to drive, but I wanted to be home. We felt dirty. We were so confused. And we wanted out of Maryland and swore we were never coming back. We missed our flight, explained the situation to the desk, and somehow got put on another flight back home. We sat in the airport for hours, dying. The flight was painful too. We made it to work a few hours late that day. Nobody believed our story and thought we made it up just because we're being late, and we kind of never brought it up again. I googled to see if similar situations happened and found nothing. We googled blue tongue and saw it's a side effect of a drug. I'll be honest, I felt lucky we made it out of there. I don't know if we were a target of a room invasion or a robbery, or if they wanted to attack or kidnap my girl. It could have turned out ugly in a lot of different ways. What if my girlfriend didn't take a huge swig? What if I drank the whole thing by myself? How close did I come to an OD or death depending on the drug and its interactions with alcohol? I swear the bartender was in on it. I did call the hotel and asked if there was any issues with the people being drugged or room robberies. And they said no, they have zero incidents. And I think I let it go. I emailed the hotel from a throwaway email I created and told them to watch the hotel roof bar and the bartender, and never got a reply. I realize this is a long story, but that's my story, and I think about it anytime someone brings up Maryland. This all started last year when I bought my first house. It was a great deal for a piece of property in the area, since it was located next to a party house. Strange people were in and out all of the time. Lots of screaming at each other late at night. Two times they knocked on my door to borrow my phone to call the paramedics. It was unpleasant, but most of them were polite and didn't bother me. All but one person. This guy gave me weird vibes from the start. He cornered me one day when I was taking out the trash and introduced himself. I forgot his name almost immediately. I was in a hurry and didn't really want to talk. He started hounding me for my own name, which I gave reluctantly, not wanting to be a rude neighbor since I was going to be living there for a while. He then pressed me for my last name and who my parents were. None of this is particularly strange since we are both First Nations and it's common for people to know each other through familial ties, and I look really young. I am often mistaken for a 16 year old, and since he looked in his 40s I didn't think much of it. Just someone my elder wanted to know if we were related or something. I started getting uncomfortable when he asked me if my parents were home. I live alone with my dog, but I didn't want him to know that, so I said they were home. He then asked me if I work, where I work. I told him that I had to go and just carried on my way. He then asked me if I wanted to come party. This was in the middle of the day and the party house looked empty. I was feeling super uncomfortable now. I ended up not answering and just going back into my house. A few times after that he tried to talk to me again while taking out the garbage. And being the wimp that I was back then, I just pretended I didn't hear him. I wish that was it, but it's not. Two months later my cellar flooded because a water line to the party house broke. My cellar is a rickety old staircase down into a concrete hole. No other exits beyond the stairs. I was in the middle of taking buckets of water out when he stood at the top of the stairs and blocked my path. 
I was terrified. The cellar behind me was soundproof because it was under my house and I was home alone. My dog was inside because the water was hazardous. I didn't have my phone because I didn't want to get it wet. He asked me what I was doing. I told him my cellar was flooded and he took a step down the stairs. I stepped back and into the water and he advanced after me. I told him it was okay, I have it handled, and that he needed to be careful because the water could be electrically charged and that I was safe because I was wearing rubber boots. Thankfully this made him stop and he left without another word. It was a big fib because my power was off, but it was the only out I could think of at the time. I waited half a minute to make sure he was gone before booking it up the stairs and into my house. I borrowed a sump pump the next day from a family friend so I wouldn't be stuck in the cellar alone for extended periods of time. He continued to try to talk to me from time to time, but the water was shut off at the party house to stop it from flooding my cellar so he was showing up less and less. Eventually the building was evicted. Some people still wandered around the property from time to time, but never him, and it was torn down some months later. Fall came around and there was a knock at my door. The neighbor. He asked me if I remembered him. I told him I never saw him in my life. He told me to have a safe night, and he left, and I hope I never see that guy again. This story happened when I was 24. I was in my second year of studying 3D animation in a sort of private school. We were sharing the building with companies revolving around the numerical world. And there was expensive material in there, so the entrance was usually monitored by two or three watchmen. And if we wanted to stay later, after school, to work on our projects, we had to give them our student cards. This, and the security cameras everywhere, I never thought that this would be a place where I could feel in danger. I must add that the school was in a city, 40 minutes by train, from my mother's house, so I was doing the two-way trip every day. A few days just before my story takes place, my mother forced my socially anxious self to go around the city and give out some applications for a summer job to about five different stores. It was lunch break when my phone rang. It was an unknown number, and usually I wouldn't answer to hidden unknown numbers like that. But as I was searching for a job, I didn't want to miss the chance that it could be a response to my applications. I went into the corridor and answered. This was a man with a very deep, mature voice. Not someone of my age, for sure. The man asked if I was Ria Russo, telling me my name and surname without a doubt. As soon as I said yes, the man started to ask how many it would cost for me to give him oral pleasure, and other things of that kind, implying that I was a whore. I can tell you the man was having fun, not the kind of fun you have when you prank somebody. I'm talking of the sexual type of fun. It's a little bit complicated to translate this in English, but his voice had this dimension when somebody is sexually aroused. The other thing I can tell is that he had a strange accent. After the surprise, I answered him, that I was not doing this sort of thing, and I hung up without a delay. I was confused and went back into my classroom, but the fact that the guy knew my name was very strange to me, and I went outside of the building to smoke a cigarette and call my mom to see what her thoughts were about the subject. She was angry, but for her it was just a bad joke from a jerk. We thought of the possibility that it could be somebody from one of the stores I applied to, my mother wasn't convinced at all, but I remember one of the guys I gave my letters to was very creepy, and I was practically convinced that it was him already. As soon as I hung up, the unknown number called me again. It gave me the creeps that he called just after I hung up with my mom, but I didn't think much of it at the time. The unknown number called me during class time and during my way home, and I decided to ignore it. This man would get tired of this little game. The next morning the story was already forgotten. I was late for my train and walked fast to the train station. As I was approaching the place, I looked at my phone to see the time remaining before my train departure, and there I froze. I had three missed phone calls from an unknown number. I directly checked when the first call occurred, three minutes after I left home. I was frightened and looked all around me. 
The avenue was crowded by people going to the train station. No creepy man waving at me from the other side of the road or any other stick like that. There was nothing, and I assure you, this is as terrifying because I couldn't see the danger, how near it was. It could be the man next to me. It could be the car passing by just now. It could be waiting for me at the next corner. If I was a gazelle at this moment, I would have been the one who felt the danger and started to run without knowing where to go. I would have to run right into the mouth of a lion. At least it's how I picture myself. I remember it as if it was yesterday. How I felt so harmless, so lost in the middle of this crowd, because there was no doubt for me that the man was looking right at me. I tried to keep my stuff together, took my train on time, staring at all the men around me, trying to guess the chances it could be this man, or that man, or maybe this man, until I finally arrived to school. I was in full paranoia mode. During the day, being with my classmates, and in this very secure building made me feel better, but I was still very aware of my surroundings, and tried to never be alone. No phone call at all during this day, but when the time came to go back home, as I was just leaving school with a few classmates, the phone starts ringing again. I thought that the man was playing with me. I was already picturing myself as the victim of one of the criminal mind serial killers. My mother took me to the police station. As nothing had been done to me physically, there were poor chances that they could do something. But she wanted me to sort of notice them, in case something actually would happen to me. Yep, not a very happy thought there too. Actually, sexual harassment is forbidden in my country. But if I understood well, for phone calls to be considered as harassment, the victim must have never answered to the majority of the phone calls. I did not know that, and felt very lucky that I had decided to ignore the phone calls. I filed a claim and the policemen told me they needed my phone number to talk to the provider in the help of identifying the unknown number, but it could take quite some time. Three days passed, weekend arrived and my mother took me to my brothers and my grandparents in the countryside during all the weekend. She didn't tell me, but I think she did it to be sure that we would all be in security during these three days. No phone calls until Monday when I came back to school, but much less than the last week. And finally the phone call stopped after Tuesday or Wednesday. In total, the man did this seven or eight days. I can't remember precisely because of the week and in interlude. Time passed. I didn't go back to school this next year. Not because of the story though but it certainly didn't help me feel comfortable there. Two years passed until the policeman I filed my claim with called me back. He wanted me to come to the police station so he could tell me the news that he had. Here's what he told me. He told me the name of the man and explained to me that he wasn't following me, but just calling at the moments he was alone. This being the moment he was driving between his work and home, which happened to perfectly match with the time that I was leaving home. His workplace being my school. The man was one of the watchmen of the building. Fortunately, he was not working there anymore at the time. But he was one of the watchmen, meaning every time I would go in and out of the building, he was looking at me. I even smiled at this guy. I guess what we can learn from this story is that if something like this ever happens to you, make sure to check your laws because it can be very specific and you could do something wrong without knowing, like lose patience and answer the phone to insult profusely, the perv who is stalking you. I was 16 years old. It was the middle of summer in Arizona, and I was spending the day at my boyfriend's house. It was probably around 11 a.m., and we were trying to figure out what we were going to do for the day. Something happened. I don't remember exactly what but we got into a huge fight. It was pretty bad, and I was tired of fighting. I put my shoes on, grabbed my bag, and left. He tried to chase after me to change my mind, but I refused. My best friend lived probably three miles away, and it wasn't too bad of a walk. Plus, it was the middle of the day, so I figured everything would be fine. I called my best friend and told her what had happened, and that I was coming over, and went on my way. As soon as I made it out of the parking lot of my boyfriend's apartment, I had this weird, awful, sinking feeling in my gut. I brushed it off and figured it was just me being overwhelmed from arguing yet again. From where my boyfriend lived to my best friend's house 
was pretty much a straight shot down a main road where there was always a lot of people out and a lot of traffic. I had walked it a hundred times before on my way to and from school. I was comfortable and not worried at all. I made it probably halfway to my friend's house and just happened to look further up ahead on the same side of the street that I was on and I see a man in a small parking lot standing beside a car. He just seemed out of place to me, which was weird because I lived in a somewhat big city with all different types of people. He had dark sunglasses on and was just surveying the road like he was looking for something. I remember thinking it was strange. I made it to the next intersection and looked up ahead again while waiting to cross the street and again there he was, the same side I was on, just standing around and looking towards the road. Something seemed off and I remember thinking I didn't want to pass by him a second time so I opted to cross the road in the other direction and not be on the same side of the street that he was on. I crossed and was now walking on the left side of the road against the direction of traffic. Feeling a bit more cautious, I started to keep an eye on all of my surroundings. The man was gone and I felt okay again. I was one street light away from where I needed to turn down to get to my friend's house. She lived just a block off the main road. Suddenly I hear footsteps behind me and I turn around. There was a man coming towards me. It was him. He saw me look at him and started walking quicker to catch up with me. He had a friendly smile on his face. He caught up with me and started to ask me directions to some place I'd never heard of. I told him I don't know and kept walking, hoping he would say okay and leave me alone, but he didn't. He stayed right next to me and kept asking questions. I was starting to panic and trying to think of what I should say next, but I felt like I was in a haze. I couldn't think straight and I was getting more and more scared. I told him that he shouldn't be talking to me because my dad was on his way to pick me up and my dad would not like it. It sounds stupid, but it was the only thing that came to my mind. He told me I was a liar and no one was coming for me. I kept insisting and telling him he needed to leave me alone. I should have just ran at this point, but like I said, I literally could not think straight. All of a sudden he put his arm around me, draped it over my shoulders and said, let's go now. I was in disbelief. Here is this stranger, this man who was putting his hands on me and now telling me what to do. I felt like my heart was going to explode, but I was just walking with him. I couldn't do anything but just to go with him. He had turned me around and we were now walking in the direction the traffic was going. Everything was in super slow motion. I remember looking down at the ground and watching my feet just walking, step after step just walking with the stranger. He kept talking to me, but it was like I was underwater, and I couldn't really hear him or anything clearly. Finally, I looked up the road and noticed where he was trying to take me. There was an abandoned house, almost completely surrounded by a tall brick wall. It felt like hours had passed, but it was only seconds. It felt almost like the blood was draining from my body. I started seeing flashes of myself, dead somewhere and thrown in a ditch. That was it. I finally snapped out of it. After being in this sort of trance, a thought finally came into my mind. My phone. I need to get my phone. Luckily, my bag was on my right arm, and he was on my left side, so he didn't really notice me reaching in to grab it. It was a flip phone, so I was able to open it up and find the call button and tap it twice to redial the last person I called, without ever having to take my hand out of my bag. I remembered that the last call I had made was to my best friend when I was telling her I was coming over. Thank God, I knew she would answer. I gave it a few seconds to ring and then just started screaming as loud as I could. I brought the phone up to my mouth and screamed help over and over and felt a rush of tears stream down my face. He saw my phone and yanked it out of my hand, slamming it closed. I kept screaming anyways. He started yelling at me and cussing. I remember him screaming at me to shut up. He put my phone in his pocket and tightened his grip on me. He had one hand on each of my arms as he walked beside me. He dug his fingers into my arms and pushed me, forcing me to walk with him. I remember shuffling around and trying to get away but there was a lot of gravel on the sidewalk and I couldn't find my footing. He was still yelling and cussing at me and I could smell the alcohol on his breath. It made me feel sick 
Plus, this whole time, there are cars driving right by us. I couldn't understand why nobody was stopping to help me. We were getting closer to the house, and I remember thinking, I need to get away, now. I stopped walking as abruptly as I could and dropped. I literally just bent down and jumped backwards, slipped right out of his hands. I think it caught him off guard. I saw a glimpse of him look at me from under his arm. He looked furious. I turned around immediately and started to run as fast as I could. I was so afraid that he was running after me. I ran directly into the road to oncoming traffic, hoping he wasn't following me. I was hysterically screaming and crying and waving my arms at people to stop. Instead, they swerved out of the way. I remember seeing people's faces looking at me as they just drove past. No one was stopping. No one would help. I turned and looked behind me, and he was nowhere in sight. I got back on the sidewalk and kept running to the direction I was going. I came to a side street. There was a silver van stopped in the middle of the road, with a younger woman flagging me down, asking if I was okay. I ran up to her, telling her someone had tried to kidnap me. She handed me her phone to call the police and told me it was okay now and that she would wait with me. Then another car pulled up behind hers, a white work truck filled with tools. Two men jumped out of the truck and ran over to see what was wrong. The woman explained what had happened while I was still on the phone with the police. They were older Hispanic men that didn't speak English very well, but they understood what she told them. One of the men ran back to the truck and brought me his big gulp to drink. It was a watered-down Pepsi, but it was so hot out and my throat hurt so much from screaming. I drank it and thought how refreshing it was. The other man asked me what the kidnapper looked like. I described to them what he looked like and what he was wearing, and without another beat they jumped back into the truck to drive around and track him down. Finally, a police officer arrived and I thanked the woman who had stayed with me. I walked over to the officer, explaining what happened while she drove off. After I told him everything, he told me I shouldn't have dressed so revealing and it probably wouldn't have happened. I was wearing a regular tank top and long leggings. It was 110 degrees out that day. He gave me his cell phone so I could call my mom to come pick me up. She answered and I told her what happened. She was 45 minutes across town at work and I think those 45 minutes were some of the worst of her life because she didn't know exactly what happened or if I was okay. The police officer then offered to take me to my friend's house, which was only a minute or two away, while we waited for my mom to get there. I ran up and knocked on her door, crying, and had a police officer with me, so when she opened the door, I couldn't understand why she looked so confused. I had called her and screamed for help, so surely she knew something was wrong, and I called and told someone I needed help. No, she answered the phone and heard me crying for help, and thought nothing of it and went on about her day. Not sure why that didn't bother me more than it did back then. Finally, my mom got there and I started crying again as soon as I saw her. I thought I would never see her again. I hugged her and just cried even more. She talked to the officer who dropped me off. He had only filed a police report and wouldn't even attempt to go look for the man who just tried to kidnap me because too much time had passed and he would be long gone by now. He had sent another officer to the scene of where everything had happened to try to find evidence. He found my phone thrown beside the tall brick wall near the house. They then fingerprinted it, but all the prints were too smudged to be of any use. And that was that. The police went on their way and never gave it another thought. It's been ten years since, but I still think a lot about it. I always make sure my doors are locked. I don't ever really go anywhere alone. I have trouble just walking to the mailbox sometimes. I get scared of getting out of my car to put gas in it if there are men around. I have to have my husband leave work to come home and be with me if there's ever any normal appointments at our home, like the maintenance man having to come inside to fix something. I instantly panic if I lose sight of my husband at the store while we're out. I still cry about it sometimes. I can't really even remember what the man's face looked like, but I'm still plagued by him to this day, and I hope I never have to meet him again. Full disclosure, I'm kind of a crap starter. I learned it from my dad. We all love to push the buttons of people and view the result, even the people we love. 
One day about six years ago, on a YouTube comment section, there was some guy posting full of bravado and self-praise about everything under the sun while putting other people down in a fashion that I found unacceptable, even though he did have excellent grammatical skills. In particular, he was singing his praises about his chess playing abilities, which he clearly took too much pride in. Being the snarky guy that I am, I called him out on it, since he was definitely over the top and it sounded like a load of garbage. I mean, the guy stated that he was one of the top chess players in the world. I went on and on about it, which I highly doubt was true. Really, it was nothing more than the typical playful banter of noise and nastiness that is YouTube comment sections. This guy, however, had narcissistic personality disorder. During the few comments that were exchanged, he admitted as much, but thought it was one of his biggest strengths rather than a weakness, and saw no reason to get help for it. From my understanding of narcissistic personality disorder, this is not uncommon. Having pissed this guy off, he made it his mission for about four weeks to research me extensively. By extensively, I mean that he probably made this his full-time job. I try to keep my social media accounts quite separate by using different usernames and posting few details about myself. But within the first week, this guy managed to locate most of my accounts and spent hours and hours posting insulting, nasty comments in response to my YouTube videos, my tweets, and my Facebook comments. He doxed me, finding my PhD maths thesis, posting it online repeatedly, and criticizing my methodology, which was ridiculous. My PhD thesis was nominated for awards, and laid out the foundation of a new area of combinatorics. I mean, this means that the dude read my PhD thesis, several hundred pages just to criticize me. Given that it's in maths, that alone is creepy. He responded to every YouTube video I had posted, taunting me with nasty comments, and replied to hundreds of my posts. Even five years old, attacking me on every detail of everything I said. We're talking small typos, to some unintentional grammatical errors, and a few bursts of outrage. I mean, this guy must have spent hundreds of hours researching me and posting in response to some of my fairly old posts. While nobody else seemed to care, it was terrifying to me to get daily notifications from him, posting my full name everywhere with detailed information about my location and my life. Fortunately, I lived in a different continent than he did, even though he made some threats to come visit me. I figured it was best to ignore him, but it went on for, as I said, about four weeks until some woman online and a very talented chess player made the mistake of insulting him about his grandiose delusions of being a master chess player, at which point he thankfully shifted sights to her. I messaged her privately and warned her about this unstable guy, but he still stalked her for several months, doxing her and demanded that she play him in chess, online at the threat of more doxing, telling her that she would play him on such a server at such and such time or else she would forfeit and be scorned. Much of the time she said she had never heard of the obscure service he mentioned, but he demanded that she comply. I finally lost track of him, but his posts remain online containing all my personal information, which is disturbing, seeing as I try to keep my social media accounts and my life as separate as I can manage. I'm not ashamed of anything I say online, but I want the division and some reasonable level of anonymity all the same. So crazy dude who's proud of his narcissistic personality disorder, I hope we never meet again, and I hope the others remain safe from you. I've learned to be much more careful about my online interactions, and to not push buttons just for the sake of doing so, because it's just not simply safe. So this happened back in 2002. I was 15 at the time, and I loved spending time with my sister-in-law, Wanda. That evening I was out with Wanda, and I was trying to kill some time until my brother got off of work. Since it was a beautiful summer night, we decided we would go to the park and walk the trails. We were laughing and talking, never thinking we would have any trouble, especially at the public park. As we were nearing the bridge, Wanda fell silent and went a bit rigid. I looked at her confused. That's when I heard the heavy footsteps behind us. I turned and saw a man completely dressed in black with his black hoodie pulled down low, shadowing his face. 
I should mention that it was nearly 8 p.m. by this time. As I turned back around, Wanda whispers, He came out of the bushes. I was caught off guard, and all I could think to say was, What? When? Pulling me in close, she said. When we rounded that corner, he just came out of the bushes and started following us. By this point, I'm getting kind of nervous, but I'm trying my best to keep calm, so I suggested that we picked up our pace and try to put more distance between us. We started walking so fast, it was practically a slow jog. Sure enough, we can hear his heavy boots start pounding the paved trail at a much quicker pace. I couldn't resist glancing back at him, again, and that's when he started staring at me, pulling his hands from his hoodie. He was wearing black gloves. My heart sank. I grabbed Wanda's arm and told her to run. We took off, and as we rounded the corner, they gave us a brief moment where he could no longer see us. So I pulled her with me, into the trees and the bushes, to cut straight across the trail that led back into the main entrance and the parking lot. We ran so fast, my legs felt numb beneath me. I heard the man coming through the same shrubs that we just came out of, and all I could do was to scream, RUN! Just then, the patrol officer was driving through the parking lot that was now about a football field's length away. We started screaming and waving our arms. Thank God he saw us. He jumped the concrete speed bump with his car, and into the grass driving right at us. He stopped and jumped out of his car and ran towards us as fast as he could. The man in black finally started to retreat, seeing an officer beginning to chase him. Wanda and I hid behind the cop's car, still shaking and trying to catch our breath. Four more cop cars showed up. They had spotlights on and search dogs. After what seemed like forever, a cop walked us to the car and followed behind us as we exited the park. Exhausted and a bit terrified, we decided to go ahead and drive to my brother's workplace. As we got onto the main road, there is a clearing that looks right onto the lake and the trail that we were walking. We couldn't resist looking, and right there, standing behind the guardrail, was the man in black. He looked right at us. He lifted his head just enough for our headlights to show his sinister smile as he waved at us. I thought I was going to throw up from sheer fear and panic. With shaking hands, I hurriedly called 911 and told them where we just saw him. To this day, I never found out if the man was ever caught, and the thought that he's still out there sends a shiver down my spine. So... I grew up in Las Vegas. I'd moved there when I was in second grade. I was around seven or so, and my mother was working at some sort of motorcycle repair shop in Arizona that just wasn't paying the bills at all. So she jumped at the offer of a new job. Fast forward about five years, I'm in middle school, and my brother and I were almost exactly two years apart. I was about to turn 12, so he was around 10 at the time. My mother, being quite low on the seniority list, was forced to work late nights. That left me and my brother home alone after school more often than not. Our nights were usually pretty uneventful, usually consisted of us avoiding whatever homework we were assigned, warming up leftovers in the microwave, and watching whatever sparked our interest on TV, which was either WWE wrestling or some kind of cartoon. We usually ended up in bed before our mum got home, but occasionally we'd wait up for her. One night, or I suppose one afternoon considering it was still light, everything was pretty normal. My brother sat on the living room floor engulfed in whatever was on the TV, and I was using my mother's desktop computer, levelling up my character on RuneScape. Then there was a rather aggressive knock at the door, which was very odd. I was sort of an outcast child. I didn't have too many friends, nor did my brother. Not only that, we lived in what you would consider a senior living community. My mother was the youngest adult there, and was around her mid-thirties. My brother, being too short to reach the peephole, doesn't move, only slightly reacts, 
and looks at me. I get up off the computer chair and make my way to the front door to glance out the peephole. I see a man in a black ski mask staring at me through the peephole. It definitely didn't seem real. It sort of seemed like something from a cliche movie, as if he were dressed to rob a bank. I was immediately scared shitless, and I obviously didn't bother asking who it was. I silently stepped away, shut off the TV, grabbed my brother on our small black pomenaria, and ran towards my bedroom. Once we were safely hidden in my closet, I informed him of what I saw outside. He didn't say much, but was visibly shaken, and just quietly stood there holding our little dog. I slid the tiny flip phone our mum lent us for emergencies from my pocket and dialed 911. I whispered to the operator the entirety of the call, and I didn't think the man had left considering the knocks persisted after we left the living room. Yet somehow, she understood me and sent an officer over. Immediately after the call ended with the operator, I dialed for our mother. I explained everything to her, and she ended up leaving work early and came home around the time that the police had as well. I'm not sure what deterred him of pursuing further, but of course, the man was gone by the time they both had arrived. The officer was very clearly not taking any of it seriously, most likely thinking that these two young boys were just paranoid from staying home alone. It was probably just a young man playing a joke on a friend, they thought. However, like I stated before, we live in a senior living community. Who could he be possibly playing a joke on? His dear grandmother? He then gave my brother and I stickers, as if that would console our nerves after seeing some masked man pounding on our door. Fortunately, I never saw the stranger after that. However, after the experience, my house did get broken into, as well as my car three times. Thankfully, none of us were present when any of this took place, since my family and I moved out of the state and installed a security system. Nevertheless, I hope we never meet again. This happened when I was 16, visiting my grandma who lives in a small town in Poland. Just for context, it was summer, and my family wasn't with me at the time. As you can imagine, living without my parents for a short time, as my grandma is really chill, was a dream. I could stay out late as often as I wanted, without my parents being able to prove it. Now at 16, you feel like you're invincible. You don't really think about how many messed up people there are in this world. Because of this mindset, I wasn't worried about walking home alone that night. The day on which this story takes place was very hot. I remember shopping and hanging out with my friends until about 8pm when it started to rain. Instead of walking home quickly, I decided to visit my aunt's house, hang out with my cousin for a bit, and walk home when the rain stopped. Well, I lost track of time, and ended up leaving her house at 10.30pm. At this point, the rain had almost completely subsided, and this being my favourite type of weather, I declined my aunt's kind offer to drive me back, telling her I was getting a cab. I'm still surprised she believed this, but maybe she just didn't care. So I went on my way, called my grandma to tell her I'd be home in 30 minutes, but not telling her that I was walking alone. If there was one thing that scared me, it were the huge train tracks that you had to cross in order to get to my grandma's house the fastest. So I decided to take the longer way round through some sort of nature preserve. I enjoyed my walk through the light rain until the long metal bridge came into view. Just as it's beginning, 
I saw a man. It was a small, quiet town, so it wasn't common for the people here to be out this late. But I wasn't scared immediately. I only saw his back, but he looked like every other guy you'd pass on the street. He didn't seem to notice me, and I didn't really care. I got distracted by looking at the trees to my left. But when I came to the beginning of the bridge, the man was nowhere to be seen. I suddenly stopped dead in my tracks, and got an ominous feeling. This man couldn't have already been out of my view. It would have been impossible for him to move this fast. He would have had to run, and I definitely would have heard him running on the metal bridge. At the end of the bridge, there was a small path that led under it. Which was hidden by thick bushes. I got even more scared by the thought that he was hiding there, waiting for me. I slowly started to walk backwards, not taking my eyes off the bushes. I hid behind a tree, and decided to wait a few minutes to see if he was hiding there. After about ten minutes, my biggest fear came true. Suddenly, the man emerged from the bushes, looking in my direction. He was holding something big, and shiny. In the dark, I still managed to make out that it was a knife. My mind started racing with a thousand questions: How did he see me? Why didn't I see the knife before? Where was he hiding it? He suddenly started to run in my direction, so fast. He ran straight past me, hiding behind this tree, and I was so relieved when he was out of sight. I ran faster than I ever ran, not stopping to look behind me. Being frightened the whole way back, thinking that he'd somehow find me, and do whatever sick things he had in mind. Luckily, I arrived home safely. My grandma waiting for me. Already mad, I decided not to tell her what happened, partially not to worry her, but also so she wouldn't tell my parents about our secret curfew. Looking back, this was one of the stupidest lies I've ever told, because of what happened a month after this incident. Two teenage girls about my age were stabbed dozens of times by this bridge. One body was found thirty meters from it; the other one was thrown into the nearby river. To this day, nobody knows who did it, but I'm pretty sure it was the same man I encountered. I was too scared to come out and tell anyone about what happened, but I can't help but feel that those two girls would have been alive today if it wasn't for my stupidity. I grew up on an island in Alaska, and lived on the same property since birth to high school graduation. Our house had two stories, and the downstairs had a bathroom, furnace room, storage room, entryway, and rec room. One of the walls had some plywood pieces up, so that we could feed extension cords through it to our crawl space. We had a C-shaped driveway that you could enter from one side, and then park in the carport, and then just drive towards the exit. The crawl space consisted of two big water tanks, because we caught our own rainwater. We also used this area for storage. The space was ten by fifteen, but only three feet high. You had to lift a cover up to get into the water tanks. And you could only enter the crawl space from the side of the house. It was a two by two door that we kept a master lock on, but never actually locked. Our dog Brewster had an area to the side of the house as well. He had a big fenced area, his own stairway and porch, which was half covered, and he had a dog house. During the summer, we had black bears in our yard most nights, and Brewster. 
would give a quick bark to let them on their way. We knew his barks. There were four of us in the family, my parents, myself and my older brother, who is two years older and has Down syndrome. My brother was in special education at school, and there were other kids who would come into the same room, but just once in a while throughout the day, because they had similar disabilities and were able to keep up some of their general classes. But some of the kids had discipline problems or mental illness. My brother was loved by the school kids and everyone knew him. One day, a native kid that was about 15 came to our door and wanted to play with Travis. We thought it was odd because Travis had moderate downs and he didn't really like playing with other kids. He liked watching kids play. Travis liked watching movies and listening to music. My mum asked the kid what his name was and he said he was Mark and he knew Travis from junior high the year prior because he would go into Travis's class sometimes for help with his homework. I remember him staring at me a little too much and he didn't seem like someone who was mentally challenged. My mother let him come in but kept a watchful eye on them. Travis seemed like he didn't want him there and my mum told Mark that we were having dinner soon and told him it was time for him to go. My mum found out that he had moved into the area where we lived but it was still a little away. He had been in and out of foster care for most of his life. His parents were abusive addicts. I think he came over another time and my mum felt bad for him and she really felt as if something was off. She felt like he was coming over because of me. My mum politely told him that Travis didn't really like having visitors and he seemed okay with that and never came over again. My parents went to a church service on Wednesday evenings and would be gone a couple of hours. I would stay home with Travis. At the time I was 11 and he was 13. I started helping out the church nursery when I was 9 and when I turned 11 my best friend and I took a babysitting course which included CPR and first aid. We would babysit together and at age 12 started babysitting on our own. My mum was a homemaker and would always be home except for Wednesday's church service. My parents didn't drink didn't do drugs nor smoke and I can only remember my parents going out a few times when we were in need of a babysitter. I would leave the downstairs door unlocked for my parents when they were going to be gone only a couple of hours. I was expecting them home in half an hour and was surprised when I heard the downstairs door open. I thought I must not have heard the car pull up and Travis was up past his bedtime so I quietly tell Travis to go to his bedroom and get to bed. I start walking through the kitchen to the top of the stairs and I call out, Mum? Dad? And I hear the footsteps stop. And I'm looking down the stairs and I can see men's work boots and jeans. This is not my parents. The way the stairs are set up, you could see the bottom half of someone without descending the stairs. I'm scared to death and I run to Travis who is going down the hall and I grab him and drag him to my parents bedroom because it's the only room that locks and has a phone. Now I don't mean this in a rude way but down kids can be very stubborn so my brother just wants to go to his room but I get him to sit down on the bed and I'm trying to keep him in the room whilst I'm grabbing a gun and I call my neighbour. I can hear him walking around downstairs still. My neighbour answers her phone immediately and I whisper to her that someone is in the house and that I'm scared. She told me to come out onto the front porch and she'll be there. I get the courage to run down the door and I get outside. Thankfully she's in our driveway and she has her hound dog with her. She lets me know that she's going to enter the house through the downstairs. She disappears from sight but comes back quickly and tells me that the door is locked so she makes her way upstairs. She gets to the top when we hear the downstairs door open and the crunching of gravel as the intruder runs off. 
She lets go of her dog, and the dog chases the person into the woods. The dog came back ten minutes later, and our neighbour sat with us until my parents got home. The police were never called, because I think my parents assumed it was a neighbour's boy screwing with me. We live in a safe place, where the only thing you have to worry about are bears and an occasional wolf. A week after this incident, our dog would bark for 15 minutes after we went to bed, consistently every night. We would look out the windows, and saw nothing. We figured it was bears, because it was springtime, and Brewster's was probably just getting used to them again. A couple of months the barking still happened. I had my best friend stay the night, and we would always stay in the downstairs so that we can be louder, and stay up as late as we'd like. Kate had a brother that was seven years older and we'd ask him to bring us booze. All the kids were starting their vices at our age. It was a little after midnight and her brother never showed up and Brewster never barked that night either. We were sitting on the stairs braiding each other's hair when we both got a feeling as if someone were looking at us. We looked over and there was a guy staring into the window. We ran upstairs in panic. We thought perhaps it was her brother, but he wouldn't have come to the window and spy on us. The face also seemed a bit darker than his, but we had the lights on downstairs, and there were no lights by that window outside, so it was hard to tell who it was. We didn't want to wake my parents up just in case it was her brother, so we waited 30 minutes and went back down to grab our stuff and went to sleep in my bedroom for the night. The next day we spoke to her brother, and he said it wasn't him. That night, Brewster's was back to barking again. Two more months go by, and I had gone to bed and heard Brewster's bark, and I looked out my window and as usual didn't see anything. I had just dozed off again, and woke up to Brewster's barking frantically. I looked out my window, and I see a guy running out of our driveway. I thought about waking my parents, but we had a trail on the side of our house that kids used to use to run to the road behind ours. The neighbourhood was on the side of a mountain, so all the kids used trails to get straight through to another road instead of using the main roads. I'd never seen someone come out of that part of the driveway because the trail was on the south side of the house along with the crawl space and Brewster's area. My room was the only room on the north side. I decided to go back to sleep and was tossing and turning. Fifteen minutes go by and I smell smoke. I go to the hall and the smell is a lot stronger and it's starting to get hazy in Travis's room, which was directly across from mine. I scream, fire, fire, wake up! My parents are up. But Travis doesn't want to get out of bed, but thank God for the strength of adrenaline. We get outside and the flames were pouring out of the crawl space. We get Brewster out of his enclosure, and the neighbours all come out to help us. The firemen were there rather quickly, but the fire had destroyed the crawl space, and my parents and Travis's rooms because they were directly over it. The firemen got the fire out, thankfully, and nobody was physically hurt. This was one of the scariest nights of my life, though. I always remember the fire chief kneeling down to speak to me after he'd spoken to my parents, and he said, Hey, Melinda, we believe it was arson. I looked at him with tears streaming down my face, and I say in anger, Who is arson? Everyone started laughing so hard, and I'm thinking, how is it funny? That damn arson could have killed our family. So he explains what arson is. I'm still actually friends with the old fire chief's son, and I share that story with him often, because his father passed away from cancer when we were teens. His father is the only happy memory I have from that horrific night. The island I grew up on had a city and a village out south. We lived out south, but before the village. We had firemen for the south, north, and the city. We had state troopers for the island, and the city cops in the city limits. My mum took my brother and I to our family friend's house, 
and my dad dealt with the fire officials and the state trooper showed up later. After the investigation, my family, neighbours and firemen pieced together that a person had been living in our crawl space for at least four months. We knew he set the house on fire on purpose. He used a box of matches. My mum said the first odd thing she noticed was that at night she smelled sulphur. We also knew who did it. It was Mark. His uncle was one of the first firemen who showed up at our house and saw him standing near our driveway watching. My mum had told him my description of what the person was wearing that I saw fleeing from our house and it was what he was wearing. Behind our house near the crawl space area my dad found out where he hung out when he wasn't at the crawl space. There was a bunch of cigarette butts, soda cans which were all found near there. But because our crawl space wasn't locked our insurance company wouldn't have paid for the repairs. Because of our water tanks, the space was supposed to be locked. So my parents never said anything to the police, and the firemen never said anything. By pursuing this, we could have not had a home, a house my father had built. It took four months for our house to be repaired, and it smelt like ozone even years later. What bothers me the most is knowing that he had seen me and my friends undressed numerous times whilst changing in the rec room during tons of sleepovers, where he had set up shop was right next to the plywood with the holes drilled through. He listened to all our secrets. I never explained to my friends that he'd seen us and heard us during our sleepovers because I didn't want them to feel sick to their stomachs like I did. I still have issues when it comes to being home alone. I can't sleep if I'm the only adult in the house. I keep the volume on everything very low and I'm scared to shower. I like to be able to see the front door and I have night terrors to this day. I'm 34 now and I've been dealing with the anxiety since the fire and panic attacks since I was 18. Just recently I was diagnosed with PTSD when the intruder was in his early twenties, he was caught for burning down a house and was put in jail. All of my childhood toys were stored in the crawl space, along with a lot of our family's sentimental possessions. So, as a kid I lived about a hundred miles away from the nearest town at a house without electricity or running water, which is the works in the Colorado Rockies. This place was in the absolute middle of nowhere, and we frequently sought all kinds of wild animals, ranging from elk, deer, coyotes and cats. Our property and a bunch of other neighbours' properties bordered National Forest roads, so to keep people off our road, we had to gate about a mile and a half from our house that we drove through before we reached our house. This time of year, we are the only people up there, as all the other homes are hunting cabins, long empty by this time in late winter. Now, this was not the type of gate that you could drive around if you forgot your key. There were tons of trees all around it, with barbed wire, ditches and such so anyone wanting for off-road around it would basically have to build a new road around this gate. Well, one night, my mother, brother and sister and I pull up to the gate and we cannot find the key. It's gone. So one of us, i.e. me, has to walk all the way back up to the house in the pitch black to fetch the spare key and make their way back down. Now, it's recently snowed in January, and it is totally dark. You can't even see your hands in front of you dark. And with the new snow, you can't hear anything either. There are a few clouds in the sky, on and off to let some starlight through every once in a while. But it's dark, and of course there isn't a flashlight either. So off I go. First, you walk through around 200 metres of trees. Then it opens up to a huge meadow, 
which then narrows back down again to trees for another 200 metres, and then opens up again into another huge meadow, which on the other side of is our house. I set out and everything seems fine. I'm just irritated that I have to do this. I'm about 15 years old at the time, and a little angsty teen that is peeved off at the slightest chore. I was not thinking about my surroundings in the slightest. But as I'm walking, I get that feeling that I'm being watched as I'm halfway through the first meadow. That deep, creepy dread that something is right behind you, and you can't see what it is, made it a thousand times worse by the lack of light and lack of being able to hear. My first instinct was to run, but I knew that if there was something, I was just going to provoke it. So I kept going, and then stopped to try and listen, as I heard a crunch echoing my footsteps. Holy shit. This time I walked a little faster, and I knew there was something behind me. It was probably a cat as well. So I just kept walking right into the second bunch of trees before it opened up into a meadow. I could see our house. I could feel the pressure. At this point we were predator and prey, and I could feel the breath on my shoes. So second clearing comes up and I know what the plan is, and I am about to book it. Thankfully, I'm familiar with what to do, and I scream as loud as I can. As I do so, my dogs hear me, and they run to chase whatever it is from behind me. They continue running past me, and I book it into the house. When I get in, I grab the 12 gauge first and the key second, then pick up the tractor keys and jump in. There was no way I was going to walk that again. As I'm driving back towards the gate, I see the dogs running back. At least they weren't hurt. That could have been extremely dangerous. I also see the tracks. I knew it was a cat. It actually started approaching me from the first meadow and was tailing me for a long time. I tell my family the whole story and I know that I'm not going to get any sleep tonight. From that day, I refuse to be out alone at night in the countryside without a weapon. It's felt like years. Allow me to explain. It was a vivid summer day, and I had taken a short notice trip to Arizona, trying to find some relief from the tiresome sunshine state on the other side of the nation. I only decided to leave when I was hit with a rather heavy day at work. My boss decided to chew me out for running late, despite the massive car crash on the motorway. A customer yelled at me because they didn't know what a Gmail was. Yeah, because I can definitely control traffic. And yeah, I definitely want to explain to you what Gmail is. I hate working customer service. So I called in sick and caught a last minute flight to Phoenix. Phoenix. Yeah, Phoenix. Nice and far away from the hell I called home. I wish. I'd never decided to do that. Around two days into my trip, I decided to head up to Zion Canyon for some sightseeing. I had spent a lot of time around the Grand Canyon and figured I should set some time apart to check out other places in the area. Besides, I'd never been to Utah before. Maybe I would take a hike, that one trail I had already read upon. Angel's Landing looked dangerous, but it would be something incredible to experience, and certainly worth it if I made the summit. I turned on Google Maps, and my rather shitty Android fumbled around with it, until finally it picked up the location. The voice of a robotic woman began to speak. It was the damn GPS lady. She guided me through several backwater roads with twists and turns and roundabouts until she stopped with a final sentence. Head on Highway 89. 
continue straight for 184 miles. All right, seemed easy enough. As I finally approached the highway, I was absolutely in awe by the view. No more buildings remained, only the wild barren landscape of the southwest. Mountains peaked in the distance, covered by desert shrubs. Old trailers and abandoned houses dotted the landscape. Everything was so beautiful compared to the constant headache that was Florida. My eyes soaked up the desert views, relieved that for once it wasn't just endless miles of swampland. I felt so isolated. I was free from civilization for miles. But something was wrong. The desert didn't feel real to me. The sun was too bright, the mountains too still, and the sky too blue. The whole landscape seemed too picturesque, as if it were straight out of a postcard. It felt as though it were all a facade to drag me into something, and it was not unlike something straight out of a fever dream. You know those mornings as a kid when you wake up with a pounding headache and sense of false reality? I'd been driving for hours, and the scenery just seemed to remain stagnant. I was so sure I'd spent the entire damn day on the road, but the sun hadn't moved an inch. Was I hallucinating? God, when was this road ever going to end? Speaking of it, I'm still here. I've been driving on this road every day. It only keeps on going and going. I've been seeing the same road signs over and over. There's no civilization around. I've tried knocking on those trailer doors, but no one's ever home. And you know what else? Despite my solitude, I feel like I'm constantly being chased. I hate that feeling. That same feeling from when you're a kid and you sprint up the stairs from the pinch of darkness down, not daring to look back at whatever was behind you. That feeling when any source of noise of your house was enough to make you jump and run for your life. The source of the noise for me was the booming. And that feeling is always here. Every once in a while I hear a booming, as if someone is going at it with a gigantic drum. I slow my car down, and the booming gets faster, closer and louder. And that feeling, every time I slow, the feeling grows stronger, as if it, whatever it was, is getting closer. It's like whatever that something is, is hunting me down, almost testing me. And every time I stop, the booming gets louder, as if it's targeting me. I don't know what that is, but I feel like it's dangerous. I don't know what chases behind me. But I know better than the kid who runs away from his basement door the first chance he gets. Running away from that something, but that something is behind me. I don't know what it is, but it's got me trapped right where it wants me to be. And I can't get out. I've driven off cliffs and into rivers, yet I wake up on the side of the road again, to the same sight, my truck waiting for me to drive off again. I can't even commit suicide. The place won't let me. I've tried communicating through whatever internet I could scrounge up on my phone, but I don't even know if anyone has seen my cries for help. The screen just shows up blank, save for my own words written in desperation. No one will ever answer my texts. No one will answer my calls. I will never see any other cars. Only me. I never get hungry or tired or thirsty, only trapped. It's like time hasn't passed. Time hasn't passed. Everyone is gone. Something's chasing me, and I'm still writing this. I think I've been in the same spot for too long. The boom's only getting louder, and now something is right behind me. Time has not passed and I need to get out now.